Good evening. My name is Melina Tsiamos, and on behalf of the Austrian Cultural Forum New York, I warmly welcome you to tonight's event. The ACFNY presents highlights of Austrian culture and thought in the US and promotes the exchange between Austrian American artists and academics. It is in this context that we pre present tonight's event on gender and sexuality in Egon Schiele's work in cooperation with the Kalir Research Institute. I thank Jane Kalir, president of the Kalir Research Institute and director of the Gallery St. Etienne and her team for the initiative for this program and cooperation in realizing it. Tonight, we will hear about Austrian painter Egon Schiele, one of the most prominent figures of Viennese modernism and mentee of Gustav Klimt. In his brief life, he was born in 1890 and was only 28 years old when he died from the Spanish flu. He created a body of work that was groundbreaking for his times. We are honored to be joined by some of the most distingu distinguished Chile experts. Let me take this opportunity to introduce you to our speakers and moderator. Jean Kalir president of the Kalir Research Institute and director of the Gallery St. Etienne in New York, is a recognized authority on Austrian and German expressionism. Otto Kalir, Jane's grandfather, founded the original Neue Galerie in Vienna in 1923 and published the first catalog raisonné of Schiele's paintings in 1930. She has published over 20 books, including the comprehensive catalogue raisonné, Egon Schiele, The Complete Works. And she has curated for many major museums internationally. Verena Gamper is the curator for the 20th century collection at the Belvedere Museum in Vienna, which is home to, among others, an important collection of Viennese modernism, as well as the iconic painting, The Kiss by Gustav Klimt. From 2018 to 2023, she was a curator at the Leopold Museum and head of its research center. There, she was responsible for the world's largest collection of works by Egon Schiele, conceiving exhibitions, conferences, and publication on the artist's work and its context. We are delighted to have a video contribution by Jonathan Katz, who regrettably cannot be here with us in person as he's currently in Europe. Um, Jonathan Katz is Associate Professor of Practice, History of Art and Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies at University of Pennsylvania. He is considered to be the founding figure of queer art history and has written extensively about gender, sexuality, and desire, producing, producing some of the key theoretical work in queer studies in the visual arts. Our moderator is Stephanie Buman. She is the ACFNY's head of visual art, architecture, and design. From 2010 to 2022, she served as director of the estate of Frederick Kiesler in New York. She has published extensively on modern and contemporary art and has curated many exhibitions. Most recently, the exhibition that is on show right now in our gallery on Roma artist Chaya Stoika. The gallery uh, is still open for the guests of the event, so if you would like to see it after this event, we, you're very welcome to explore it afterwards. First, we will hear three presentations by our speakers, followed by the conversation part. And after the event, we hope that you will join us for a, a glass of wine and an opportunity to meet everyone. I wish you an enjoyable evening and give the floor to our first speaker, Jane Kalir. Thank you, Melina. 
Uh, before getting started, um, I'd also like to thank the Austrian Cultural Forum for hosting this evening's event, the second in what I hope is becoming a series of collaborations between the ACF and the Kalir Research Institute. Um, in particular, I'd like to thank Susanna Kepler-Schlesinger, director of the ACF, who unfortunately isn't here tonight. She happens to be in Vienna, uh, as well as her excellent team, Melina Tsiamos, Stephanie Buman, and Valentina funes Reiner. Um, I'm also grateful for the help I received from my colleagues at the KRI, Courtney Donner, and Christina Brown Roman, as well as last but emphatically not least for the participation of our esteemed speakers, Verena Gumper and Jonathan Katz. The impetus for this evening's panel arose some years ago in connection with my research on the Sheila catalog resume. Most Sheila fans encountering his art in books or exhibitions see selected works in isolation from the totality of the oeuvre. But when you're compiling a catalog resume, you look at everything. So in the course of my work, I became fascinated by this series of 1910 watercolors that I like to call the Red Men. Now, the first thing you need to know about these red men is that there are an awful lot of them. Some three dozen recorded works, all of them dating to the first half of 1910. The second noteworthy thing is that during this period, Sheila's male nudes easily outnumber his female nudes. And the third most important thing about the red men is that they represent a major turning point in Sheila's development. Prior to this time, Sheila had been very much under the influence of Gustav Klimt. Unable to afford gold leaf, the younger artist instead used metallic foil and billed himself as the quote unquote silver Klimt. His portraits shared Klimt's affinity for decorative patterning and triangular profile poses. The 1910 Red Men, then, are not only completely different from Sheila's earlier work, they're unlike anything any artist in Vienna had ever done before. Traditionally, Art historians believe that the red men were all self-portraits. This is to some extent understandable because during the same time period, Sheila executed three life-sized nude self-portraits in oil. Only one of those paintings survives, but we can assume, based on the painting and the studies for the other two, that all three canvases employed the same lurid, bright hues as the red men watercolors. The contorted poses of the self-portraits and the red men are also similar. Looking more closely at the red men, however, one realizes they couldn't possibly be self-portraits. First of all, most of them are views from above or behind, poses that would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, for Sheila to capture if he himself were the model. Second, the faces are almost invariably obscured, either by cropping or by deliberate blurring. Sheila's self-portraits were, above all, explorations of his own identity, and his face usually figured quite prominently even in the more sexually explicit of these works. On the other hand, if, as I now believe, the subjects of Sheila's 1910 male nudes were homosexual or bisexual men, there would have been good reason to conceal their identities. Sodomy was a crime in Austria at the time, and no one who aspired to a bourgeois existence 
would have dared to lead an openly gay life. When, in early 1910, Sheila exhibited some of the Red Men in Prague, they were confiscated by the local police on moral grounds. Sheila's association with Vienna's gay community seems to have begun in 1909, when he sought out the painter Max Oppenheimer. Mop, as he was called, openly embraced his queer identity and, partly as a result, was ridiculed and denounced by certain of his colleagues, most notably by Oskar Kokoschka. Under Mop's influence, Sheila swiftly abandoned the decorative Klimtian aspects of his style, adopting instead a more somber psychological approach. Sheila's 1910 watercolors of Mop are among his first expressionist works. In the fleshy areas, you see the same acrid coloration found in the red men. These brighter tones are set off against Mop's flat black garments, which still retain traces of Art Nouveau stylization. In January 1910, Sheila grew closer to another colleague, Erwin Osen, who was also gay or bisexual. Osen, a peripatetic artist who also worked as a stage designer and performed in cabarets as a mime, was relatively circumspect about his sexual orientation. His sometime partner was the exotic dancer Moa Mandu, though it isn't clear whether their relationship was sexual or merely professional. Several friends may have modeled for the red men, but Osen was probably the principal subject. He's identifiable in four bust-length nude portraits from the same period, and the gyrations of the anonymous figures are in keeping with his performative talents. It must, however, be noted that while Sheila's collaborations with his friend may have touched upon forbidden territory, the resulting nudes aren't in the least bit sexy. Their raw flesh appears to have been flayed, their bony contortions resist embrace, and their facelessness precludes any prospect of human connection. Even the genitals are blurred a possible act of self-censorship that nonetheless impedes erotic engagement. The red men look more like lab specimens than like live human beings. Because Sheila failed to depict any supporting props, like pillows or chairs, their bodies appear to have been pinned to the sheet. This effect is heightened by the fact that the red men are characteristically presented from oblique angles, often from above. Rather than viewing his subjects frontally, Sheila liked to perch on a stool or a ladder, with the model posing below him on a mattress. As a result, drawings of recumbent figures are frequently signed as verticals, a counterintuitive placement that nonetheless reflects this elevated perspective. The seemingly simple change in orientation has proved to be one of the artist's most controversial innovations. Combined with the blank backgrounds and selectively cropped body parts, Sheila's approach, approach generates feelings of spatial ambiguity and sexual anxiety that can unnerve some viewers even today. In addition to serving as a model, Osen was a formidable intellectual influence on Sheila. The mime presented himself as a romantic world traveler, modeling his autobiographical stories, which turn out to have been largely invented, in part on the real-life adventures of the poet Arthur Rimbaud. 
Sheila soon became obsessed with Rimbaud, writing poetry in a similar style and referencing the Frenchman in painting titles such as Self Sears, Delirium, and The Poet. Like Rimbaud, Sheila had a difficult relationship with his mother and a conflicted engagement with Catholicism, the religion in which he was raised. He shared the poet's disdain for bourgeois authority and his perceived need to salvage Christ's authentic spirituality from the formulaic teachings of the church. Like Rimbaud, Sheila wanted to inaugurate a new spiritual and aesthetic order. And, like Rimbaud, he adopted sight as a central enduring metaphor, symbolizing both prophetic vision and an artist's literal stock in trade. The poet, Rimbaud had written, makes himself a seer by a long, gigantic, and rational derangement of all the senses, all forms of love, suffering, and madness. He searches himself. He exhausts all points in himself and keeps only their quintessences." End quote. Rambeau's reference here to all forms of love is commonly interpreted as an allusion to the poet's homosexual experiments, which culminated in a disastrous affair with his colleague, Paul Verlaine. Sheila, likewise, was driven to explore his erotic urges as fully and deeply as possible, but it isn't known whether he had sexual relations with Osin or any other male. Sheila spent the summer of 1910 in Krumau, his mother's birthplace, together with Osin and another colleague, Anton Peschke. Their entourage was soon joined by a local gymnasium student, Willy Lidl, who was obviously smitten with Sheila. Lidl followed the artist everywhere, sketching by his side and writing his own Rambeau-inflected aphorisms. And when, in the autumn of 1910, Sheila returned to Vienna, Lidl sent him what can only be described as a histrionic love letter. Hagan, the letter begins, the whole world is stacked against me, and it will eventually crush me to death. At school, they reproached me horribly on your account, and I love you so infinitely. I live only for you. If you stand by me, I will be strong, but if you leave me, it will be my death. Aegon, I am tired. Do you love me? Give me certainty or there will be a catastrophe. My brain is burning. Don't be cruel. I will sacrifice myself for you. Just stay with me. Come soon. You promised. End quote. As is evident from this letter, Lidl's sexual orientation was beginning to come into open conflict with conventional social mores. He'd recently been reprimanded by the gymnasium director for quote unquote, undisciplined behavior outside of school. In the course of the next months, he'd end up being kicked out of school altogether and effectively disowned by his parents. Subsequent correspondence suggests that Lidl's mother blamed Sheila for her son's troubles. Regardless, though, of whether his love for the artist was reciprocated, Lidl's experiences starkly illustrated the danger at the time of trying to live as a gay man. Probably for similar reasons, Sheila's patron, Arthur Rustler, tried to steer the artist away from Ozen. He feared Sheila would abandon art to accompany the mime on his wor world travels, much as Rimbaud had, at the age of 21, forsaken poetry for wilder adventures. 
It may further be noted that in 1911, Ressler, an art critic, withdrew from publication a monograph on Oppenheimer after the book had already been printed. In any event, Sheila's ties to Mop, Osen, and Liedl gradually loosened. And by the end of 1910, women had come to dominate among the artist's nudes. For the first time, Sheila's work evidenced sustained relationships with female models outside his immediate family. The series of male nudes was almost entirely discontinued, and the artist's romantic encounters hereafter were, so far as we know, entirely heterosexual. Sheila had developed his approach to the nude largely by working with male models, and therefore, when he switched to females, his compositional stratagems departed radically from traditional practice. Taking his cue from Rimbaud, Sheila functioned as both subject and object, separating his own erotic responses from those of the model in order to conduct a quasi-clinical investigation of human sexuality. Like the red men, recumbent females were frequently viewed from above, and they, too, were effectively pinned to the sheet like lab specimens. Unlike the red men, however, these women have faces. Often the model seems to stare impassively at the artist. It's impossible to know what she's thinking or whether the image depicts her reaction to Sheila or his reaction to her. Freed from the illusion of three-dimensional space, the female nude retains an autonomous presence absent from classical examples of the genre. The cropping and fragmentation of her form undermine the nude's erotic hold on the viewer while affirming her agency. Sheila had shattered the controlling primacy of the male gaze in the process inventing a completely new approach to depicting gender. Thank you. And now we're going to hear from Verena Gamper. So, <clears throat> just a second, I have to adjust a little bit. Thank you, Jane. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to this uh, panel discussion on, on this highly interesting topic, uh, a topic uh, which, um, of course, could um, is such a broad field that could be that it could be approached from very different perspectives. We could look at it from the angle of Freud's discovery, or at least definition and scientification of sexuality, of sexual drive, which shaped the zeitgeist in turn of the century Vienna. We could as well contextualize it with the rise of the women's rights movement in Vienna at the time and the related crisis of masculinity on the one side, as well as the rampant misogyny um, at the time. Or we could compare how sexuality and the social norms and taboos associated with it were reflected in the different artistic disciplines. Above all, I would say in literature, but also in theater and in the visual arts. Within the latter, there's no doubt that Sheila's dealing with the topic of sexuality and gender is of outstanding intensity and urgency, and that it transcends a preoccupation with the, sub with the subject that is just due to the spirit of the time. This is why I decided to feed this discussion somehow with a maybe lesser known argument that might help to understand why sexuality became of such fundamental and existential relevance to Schiele, and then uh, sh show or reflect on how he staged body and gender in his expressionist heyday. 
Let us first look at a motive that is perhaps not the first that comes to mind when one thinks about uh, sexuality and gender in Sheila's work. It is the motive of the mother, or more specifically, mother and child, that appears frequently in uh, his painterly oeuvre, as you can see in, his, in the selection, randomly selection, of uh, mother and child depictions which were um, painted between 1910 and 1915. Uh, just to give you the information, all works which are in black and white are lost or th their whereabouts un un unknown. So even more striking than the frequency is the way in which Schiele stages the mothers and with, with which titles he additionally directs the reading of the works. We see mothers with closed eyes, uh, sunken, expressionless faces, um, or even pale skulls, over limiting, enclosing, or powerless bodies. The images bear titles, and they are original ones, uh, such as dead mother, blind mother, or pregnant woman and death. Far away from the qualities commonly associated or connoting motherliness, such as love, protection, and care, there is a glaring gap between the mother and the child, with which, uh, which, with its bright vitality, stand in stark contrast with uh, the morbid mother. At first sight, this group of mother-child images forms an erratic block uh, within Schiele's oeuvre, but by looking at his biography, they can be read, or they could be read, as resulting from a trauma he suffered as an as a adolescent boy. That was the loss of his father, to the venereal disease of syphilis. I'm arguing that this experience was fundamental for Schiele's understanding and reflection of sexuality in his work. So Schiele's father most likely contracted syphilis already before his marriage to 12-year-younger uh, Marie Sukup, infecting, uh, in by, um, infecting by doing so his future family with this disease. Um, Syphilis had become increasingly rampant in Vienna at, in the mid-19th century again. So just to give you a, a few numbers, in 1879, 2% of all citizens were infected with the disease, which is a large number. And the figures uh, increased in the following years. The numerous registered, as well as the numerous anonymous uh, female sex workers in the city, we talk about a number of 15,000 registered ones, in 1900, were identified as the carriers of the disease. This identification of syphilis with a female sex worker was preceded by an earlier shift from the male syphilitic to the female one. So that was a shift which had uh, been uh, done already, uh, I would say, centuries before, but which resulted uh, in making the woman the guilty perpetrator and the man, the victim of her seductive um, energy. So Sheila's father's contagion is in line with the class-related ge uh, gender behavior conventional in turn of the century Vienna, which would be a woman from a bourgeois family had to enter marriage as a virgin, while a man from the same class uh, was supposed to be sexually experienced when entering marriage bridging the time with women who were accessible for, for these purposes. And um, just to give you another number, in 1915, up to a quarter of all registered female sex workers in Vienna were said to be infected with syphilis. Just this was a little bit of an excourse to give, give you an, uh, um, background information on, on this disease in Vienna. So Sheila's father died on New Year's Eve of 1904, when the only son was only 14 years old. The four years prior to his death, he was increasingly uh, marked by the disease through intellectual and also physical deterioration that made him unable to work and ultimately heralded also the social decline of the family. It must be assumed that Sheila was aware of the nature of syphilis and the circumstances of infection, as well as about the classistic narratives it was associated with. But the loss of his father did not find the direct precipitation in Schiele's work. So 
but we where we find no images of fathers unless uh, if we consider the Klimt images of, uh, as father figures, of course. But um, while, as we have seen, mothers with children are very frequent. And as we have already seen, they are, they are marked by an ominous dissonance. I would like to argue that the figure of the dead mother, the death-bringing mother, or the mother allying herself with death, uh, Sheila seems to visualize the link between sexuality and death, that he had experienced as causal through his father's disease. Taking into account the prevailing narrative on syphilis, uh, as outlined before, and which saw the guilt with the woman, the lethal mothers could be read as to be generated through a kind of superimposition of the assumed victim, uh, which would, would be the, the father, and the assumed perpetrator, uh, which would be the sex worker. Uh, very, um, yeah, quote. Thus becoming uh, ultimately, um, and I'm talking about the mothers, they become ultimately an allegorical fusion of the two driving forces of Eros and Thanatos. It is very likely that Schiele himself felt threatened by the disease and the reflection of his father's fate as the only son, reinforced also by the fact that at the age of three he had already lost his older sister, uh, to a, she was 10 years old then, to a syphilis-related meningitis. So by describing the children So by describing the children and thus himself, in a promising, genial vitality, as he did again and again in works and in words, this can be an understood as an attempt to escape this vicious circle. I would like to quote from a letter Sheila wrote to his mother in 1913, which is um, a couple of years uh, later, but it's quite, um, quite uh, interesting to, to see how he describes himself. So, quote, Without doubt, I will be the greatest, most beautiful, most expensive, purest, and most valuable fruit. In me, all beautiful and noble effects have united through my independent will, also because I'm a man. I will be the fruit which will still leave eternal living beings after its decomposition. So how great must be your joy about it to have brought me. Regardless of how much Sheila consciously perceived of it, the syphilis destroying his family shaped his understanding of sexuality as the driving force of the cyclical dynamics of life between becoming and decaying, or as he once put it in German, mein Wesen, mein Verwesen, which would be my being and my decay. The libido was hence first linked with the broad spectrum from the most intense lust for life to abysmal misery, making everyday life a constant struggle for mastery and urge for satisfaction at the same time. It is Willy Liedl, whom who we have already heard about today, who describes best this struggle of his friend Schiele in a text written about 1911. Quote, he, and he references Schiele, he is one of the most courageous and cruel to himself. See Egon Schiele not as a faithful monk, but one who anesthetizes himself through torment and asceticism. The saint in the Weltwehmut, which would be this painting, is not a religiously enchanted art saint, but the one who does not know which pleasures he should indulge in. And so he throws himself into the sexuality, into the sensually self-consuming pleasure of asceticism. And because he has found nothing great and high enough to give himself completely to, he destroys himself. End quote. Against this background, Sheila's numerous self-dramatizations, I would say, is saint, prophet, monk, or ascetic can be read as projections of a sovereign identity that keeps corporeal needs in check, as opposed to those self-representations in which his body seems to have taken the lead. 
like in this, in this selection of works from all from 1910. So to sum it up, through the father's death from syphilis, I've tried to explain the existential urgency with which the topic of sexuality of humans as sexual beings is expressed in Sheila's work. And like under burning glass, this personal experience authenticated and intensified the contemporary dis scientific, literary and artistic discourse on sexuality in Vienna around 1900. I'd like to come to a second argument now. It is introduced with a group of drawings of pregnant women, so again mothers but expectant mothers, which differ strikingly from the depictions of mothers we've seen before. They were created in the first month of 1910 in the second women's clinic in Vienna, a then very modern hospital dedicated to the cure and care of women. Though the institutional context is very specific, Sheila refrains from reproducing it, casting the women on the naked sheet of paper. Yet the clinical encounter is inscribed in the depicted bodies, their frontal rendering with the exposed belly and partially spread legs, reflecting the pathologizing gaze of a gynecological examination. The great absentee in these depictions is the acting physician, who can be identified with Erwin von Graff. You see it on the left side. He was a gynecologist and from 1910 on assistant to famous Ernst Wertheim at the second women's clinic. Graf had been acquainted with Schiele at, at least since the beginning of, beginning of 1910 and later that year he made a portrait of the doctor with bare arms, which you can see on the left. Among others, these bare arms might be uh, a reference to his teacher Wertheim, who was known for his physical engagement and for never wearing gloves during operations. Uh, as you can see in this painting by John Quincy Adams, which is titled The Operation, from 1909. So by showing the treated patients separated from the attending physician, Schiele inserts himself into this regime of gazes and power. He returns the doctor's gaze not only as a portraitist, I would argue, but quasi in representation of the patient to whom the examining gaze and the ready-to-grasp gesture are actually directed. At the same time, he looks at the bodies not only at, uh, at the bodies of the pregnant women, not only as an artist, but literally from the doctor's perspective. This liquefaction of roles through the weaving in of his own position, this re-evaluation and flexibilization of the seeing and the seen of subject and object is what makes this group of works so fascinating. How does it feel to be the one who's watched? How does it feel if the gaze is returned and the roles are switched? And ultimately, what if the gaze itself becomes the subject of the painting? In addition to these drawings of pregnant women, Schiele at the same time created another group of works in the second women's clinic. And you see here uh, three of them uh, of a group, as, as far as we know, of six uh, depictions of newborns. So these depictions of newborns thrown onto the paper like into life, in their defenseless physicality on the border of the representable and also uh, at the border of uh, the viewable. Against the backdrop of these drawings of pregnant women and newborns, I'd like to turn to one of the best known uh, works by Schiele now, by Schiele's expressionist heyday at, uh, of the first half of 1910, which would be the seated male nude, a self-portrait. It is this self-portrait of the 20-year-old that is nowadays considered um, yeah, among or the culmination of his early maturity and moreover seems to express the crisis of the individuum as a core theme of Viennese modernism so congenially that is often used as a visual cipher for it. 
let me briefly outline the production and exhibition context of this painting, which I seem, I think it's, is interesting. It belongs to a group of works all conceived in early 1910 and submitted for presentation at the first international hunting exhibition in Vienna. It's a strange uh, exhibition which really was focusing on, on hunting, but they also had an art section. The exhibition committee only admitted the now lost fe seated female nude with outstretched arm, which you can see in this only surviving exhibition uh, installation view. It's the second painting from your right. And you see uh, next to it also uh, the prep pre preparatory drawing, which has survived. If one looks at the group of works submitted, it would of course be interesting to further extend on the fact that none of the submitted works fit the thematic focus of the exhibition, which was hunting. However, uh, what is interesting for our today's topic is that it was not Schiele who chose the female nude for the exhibition. He had proposed three self-nudes, which you can see here, and two of his sister, which the one which uh, was, has, was could be seen in the exhibition installation and the one you can see here. And um, with the one finally chosen being the least pro provocative because being uh, A, um, a female nude, and B, uh, having the genitals covered, while all the others are very so open, uh, in open um, bodily exposure. A few months before the hunting exhibition, and I'm talking about the beginning of February 1910, 14 drawings by Schiele were confiscated by the police uh, right the day before the opening of an exhibition in Prague. And as we know from um, newspaper reviews, these were all male nudes and mostly self-portraits. On the one hand, these two examples should make clear that the public image of the artist was largely determined by, uh, not from the outside, and on the other hand, they show that Schiele dealt offensively with the body from the very beginning. And that he did so, at least in the formative months between, I would say, summer 99 and autumn 1910, not exclusively, but to a great extent, with the male body and his own. Finally, what also becomes clear is that this, very, that this early engagement with the body is accompanied by a deliberately weak differentiation between the male and the female, as can be seen in these works. In this way, the body is emphasized as the common and unifying basis of all beings, while at the same time visualizing the performative nature of gender. If we look at the seated male nude again and place it next to a depiction of a newborn and of a pregnant woman, the different bodies seem to overlap and come together in an almost gender-neutral corporeality. Schiele stages the body as the material basis of human existence without distinguishing between the self and the other, and thus without differentiating between genders and also ages. Moreover, Schiele seems to consciously present his own gender as a performatively generated construct in need and with the potential of constant renewal, as can be observed in his nearly 200 self-portraits. He plays himself free of gender stereotypes and the social conventions associated with them. The bodily facts are presented detached from gender norms that have long been associated with them. By solidarizing the bodies in their physicality, the subject gains access to all possible identities. And by declaring identities as performative and fluid, Schiele ultimately proposes a queer image of identity. And to close, I would quote from a poem which he titled Self-Portrait, and it dates from 1910. Quote, I am everything at the same time but I, I will never do everything at the same time." End quote. Thank you. So it's up to me to introduce our next uh, contributor, which, uh, who unfortunately can, can't be here with us tonight, but uh, I will welcome him as well. Um, nevertheless, it's Jonathan Katz. 
Hello, everybody. My name is Jonathan Katz. I'm a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm sorry I can't be with you today, but I did want to give you a little taste of my research um, on the development of Sheila and Austrian Expressionism generally. And doing that, I'm going to be comparing it as you're about to see. Let me pull up my screen here. Um, I'm going to be comparing it to um, contemporaneous work in Germany. And so here I'm showing you um, some work by the German artists, uh, Sasha Schneider, along with uh, Sheila, uh, nude boy, uh, one year apart, 1911, 1912. And I think you'll agree that they're very different looks. Um, in fact, the Schneider seems to be, um, you know, as classicizing as it can be um, with an attempt at serried rows of figures, uh, some of them even wearing a sort of classicizing uh, headband. Unlike the Sheila, which has its legs and arms akimbo, wide-eyed portrait, the very obverse of the composed and collected images in the Schneider. And in part, we can uh, attribute this difference to substantive differences in national identities and national approaches. At the time that Schneider is working on uh, uh, gymnasium, uh, the Germans are beginning, or actually well into, um, a turn towards the classical, uh, a turn towards the classical that is absolutely tied to German ambitions and German national identity. This is Germany as the new Greece. Um, and uh, central to its conception is something called Freikorpur culture, FKK. And what that means is free body culture. What it effectively uh, resulted in is the embrace of athletic competition in the classical model, uh, often in the nude, um, the development of the mind and the body uh, together. Indeed, to this day, uh, German grammar schools are still called gymnasium. So that's an evidence of the inheritance of this classicizing tradition. No such tradition was uh, available in contrast in Austria. And indeed, as Shorsky and another, other scholars have written, in fact, the Austrian social and cultural situation was completely different than the German one. In, in part because whereas there was a collective vision of Germany as the new Greece, as the return to a classicizing impulse, in fact, it seems that in Austria, the converse was true. There was no national identity. The, the a uh, possibility of individual involvement in politics had been foreclosed. And the newly ascendant bourgeoisie, the rising social class of the period, felt cut out. And so they turned inward towards psychologically resonant forms that expressed their alienation. So broadly, I'm trying to suggest that um, under FKK, under a kind of classicizing impulse, Germany turned towards a nationalist visit, vision, whereas the Austrians, and Sheila is a perfect example of this, turned instead towards a very much more personal and eccentric vision. And so again and again, we look at Sheila, we look at the German artist, uh, Sasha Schneider. Uh, he was born in St. Petersburg, but he trained in Germany and lived in Germany. And we see totally different approaches to representation of the human form, um, both formally and psychologically. And in fact, so profound was the German investment in the relationship between mind and body that Schneider did something absolutely insane from our perspective. He set up a bodybuilding studio in his own art studio. And so what he's doing in athlete in basic position was a series of canonical poses, essentially trying to tell people that he can actually sculpt their bodies as he sculpted in bronze and clay and build their form. Well, needless to say, the kind of men who could afford this 
were older men. And Schneider, in a private letter, writes and says he's very dismayed because he had hoped to be able to train handsome young men. And instead, he's getting these older guys. And he eventually has to close down the studio because it's just not fun for him. Um, but this is the studio in his own apartment. And you can see that bodybuilding equipment and art making are utterly conjoined. It's that world that is the German world. And we can see, again, a huge contrast between Max Oppenheimer's The Bleeding Man um, on the right and Sasha Schneider's Icarus on the left. Um, the Bleeding Man with vague kind of religious uh, overtones, but those wild eyes and classically uh, sort of uh, the 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 drapery pulled off the pubic region, um, giving the sort of hint of genitalia. Both of these artists um, are gay men or homosexual men, as would have been the term at the time. Um, but what's interesting is whereas um, homosexuality made one in Austria essentially an isolated figure, uh, separated from the social norm. Paradoxically, in Germany, one could join in a nationalist vision of sort of health and male beauty through a nationalist guise. And so, of course, Sch Sasha Schneider is homoerotically invested in these men, but he's also able to claim, right, full participation within a German polity. So strong, in fact, was this classicizing impulse in Germany that there was something called living marble, marbles. And I'm showing you two examples here. Uh, of course, very typically, we have lots of examples of the living marbles in uh, female form. Very rare to find them in male form, but they did exist. Essentially, what would happen is if you were a wealthy um, person and you wanted to throw a garden party, you would hire people to essentially dust their bodies with marble dust. They were first covered with honey, then with marble dust. And they would be standing in your garden as living sculptures, um, changing poses every 10 minutes or so, so people could know that they were in fact alive. And of course they had perfect classical forms, obviously a reference to the classical past. And needless to say, again, in accordance with German ideology, a way of combining an obvious erotic interest in looking at the nude with a larger nationalist politics. So you could claim to be, of course, um, engaged in um, envisioning the future of Germany when in fact you are getting off on looking at beautifully formed naked people. So, in Sasha Schneider's Growing Strength from 1904, we see a sort of perfect instance of this um, relationship between the homoerotic and the nationalist. And I want to draw a key distinction then between that work and this. Um, roughly contemporaneous, um, we're looking at uh, Sheila's image of Max Oppenheimer and Max Oppenheimer's uh, portrait of Sheila. Uh, they were very good friends at the time. Um, and as you can see here, both of them are doing exactly the obverse of what we just saw here, right? Instead of this sort of classicizing, historicizing, and, and beautiful bodied images, we have the expressionist impulse. Uh, Sheila's hands look like he can't even hold a brush. And these two figures, very close to one another at this moment, um, are deliberately engaged in what looks to be unhealthy imagery. Um, Sheila's portrait of Oppenheimer has a sort of faint, uh, sort of green, death-like pallor. Uh, Oppenheimer's portrait of Sheila seems vacant and um, and really quite remarkably unartist-like. And here we see two more portraits by Sheila of Max Oppenheimer with again, these sort of green tones to the body. 
Compare that to Ludwig von Hoffmann's bathers. Background is green, but the figures aren't. Uh, fully rounded, fully materialized. Um, they are weighty human bodies. Unlike Oppenheimer's flagellation of 1913, which shows us these attenuated bodies and an extremely uh, fraught expressionist scene of human suffering. And Schneider, again, athlete, 1921, total classicizing. So we see such a clear distinction between the German and the Austrian. This is Sheila's Eros of 1911, an image that seems almost impossible to imagine in a German context, such as this one, Ludwig von Hoffmann's Nude Boatmen and Boys, a picture that is doubtless exceedingly homoerotic, but frankly, because of its connection to an investment in a nationalist German vision, escapes inscription as such. Not so, obviously, the Sheila, two men, 1913. And so what I'm trying to suggest then is that homosexuality made German artists essentially ultra-nationalist in their framing of representation. It brought them into the very core of German identity, whereas homosexuality made Austrian artists quite distinctly segregated from the social norm, marginalized, and made other. Thank you. We have volume. Oh, we have volume. Good, good. So thank you both very much for your presentations. And thanks to Jonathan. You just fed us with so many fascinating ideas um, about an artist that I think most of us probably felt we knew a lot about. But you both found new angles to discuss. And I think um, one term that keeps resonating with me after these presentations is um, gaze as subject. It's something that Verena, you uh, phrased in your talk. And perhaps we can start a conversation uh, with the question, who was the subject? Was it the artist? Was it the one portrayed? Or is it the in-between space? I, I love, Jane? Yeah? Well, I love Verena's idea that the gaze is the subject. I think that's, is this on? Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. good, OK. <laughs> OK, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's beautifully put, because we really don't know, do we? Uh, and uh, there is a famous Rambeau quote, uh, to go back to him, uh, I is another, with, with the grammatical error being intrinsic to the quote, in other words, expressing the fact that you are the object and the subject at the same time, and that that is the role of the poet or of the artist, and I think that is how Sheila saw it. Um, yeah, I could, <laughs> I could, maybe I can, and I can extend it to to a topic which I think it's is interesting is that. Um, because what we haven't touched now, or we largely haven't touched it in our presentations, is uh, the depictions of female um, persons, which most of the time are not identifiable unless uh, there are names of models or partners by Schiele. And um, what I was, uh, what I always thought um, or found very um, convincing. Uh, or I, let me put it in, in another way. I found those work, works most convincing when I had the impression that there is a subject-object exchange or a switch uh, between the one who does the painting or the drawing and the one who's represented in the painting or in the drawing. And uh, those are also the works which, not just by me, but also by others, are among those who are... Uh, um, supposed to be the strongest Sheila drawings because it's then you have this um, 
it's about the gaze which is exchanged and which uh, it's not just the gaze, it's of course loaded with desire, with the fear, with the, um, maybe also the, the project to taming what you are framing. And, and it's, it's, um, if you have this balance which is undecided, maybe an open game also between the looked and the looking, I think those are the most convincing ones. And also for me as a woman, the most easy to look at because I feel the strength and the power uh, as a as a equivalent. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm using the right words, but I, I hope you understood what I wanted to say. It's the kind of connection that probably often occurred spontaneously without um, prediction, I would think, in the moment between Sheila and whoever he portrayed. But um, also the term clinical came up um, when you talked about observation. And yet there's also this idea that he was very impassioned, perhaps even projecting himself onto subjects, the red men that you talked about. Can you both maybe talk a little bit about this difference, the clinical gaze and then also the kind of self-projection, perhaps even of his own sexuality or sexual desires? Well, I guess, Verena, you were talking about clinical in the literal sense, in the, in the uh, gynecological clinic of Dr. von Graf uh, and Sheila kind of exchanging places with the doctor. Uh, I think the sense in which I was using the term is related but different in that Sheila is investigating sex, his own erotic urges, but he can't, in order to do that, he has to look at the object of his desire. And so in conducting that examination, they change places. And suddenly, she becomes the subject rather the object. And that's why there's this uh, it's, it's not quite clear who is in which role. But you are arguing that um, the red men were objects of desire. That's a very clear they, argument. They were, they, they were um, well, I think, you know, Sheila's sexuality, his sexual orientation to me remains a mystery and I'm not suggesting uh, that he ever acted on these impulses. I think there was an element of fear intrinsic to his approach to sexuality, quite probably, as Verena suggested, because of the syphilitic inheritance. Uh, maybe a feeling that a male partner might be, quote unquote, safer than a female. I don't know. Uh, but uh, I don't know if the men were objects of desire or objects of examination. You know, it's it's you know it's it's this ambiguity that makes the work so continually alive to us. The fact that we we don't know and we'll never know. That's a point what I, uh, that I find also very interesting is this ambiguity, which I think um, I always have the impression that Sheila's uh, works um, um, refrain from, like, um, from giving us answers or from uh, letting us find final answers to what they are showing to us or what they are, what, to the questions they are raising. It's also maybe the point why Sheila is so um, show, so attractive to to a contemporary re-examination uh, again and again. So this won't be the last one, um, but I see it also with the public, which um, visits the museums. They are very much they feel maybe they feel I would even say they feel um, uh, there's a stronger effect or affection with the works. Then, for example, with the one with the ones by by Klimt, also if I don't know if I should say that, but it, so it's um, they are no they are not easy works. They are not giving us um, solutions. So it's more questions and uh, this ambiguity you were talking about. It lays some sometimes it lays in the bodies itself. So also, for example, this 
the, the yellow nude, the seated nude, which I had uh, as sort of a final work to show, there it has in the body itself is it has such a lot of ambiguity, uh, which re uh, goes from um, fear to self um, consciousness, which goes from one, one could even say female parts, female breasts, to very uh, masculine behavior. So it's 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 very fluid in its um, in rendering bodies and identities. And I think that's that's the that's the point with Sheila, which at which we look. Which nowadays. couldn't be more current. This fluidity mm. in terms of gender, in terms of identification, and how we mm. understand ourselves. And I think Jane, um, when we talked a few days ago for the first time in length, um, you said that every generation has their own Egon Sheila and goes to Sheila in a new way. I think that's true, and I think, you know, at least since the 1960s, he has been the artist of late adolescence or early adulthood. And I think that's because he himself was 19, 20, 21, 22, when he created most of these works. And so everyone, as they come to terms with their own sexuality, and as they come to terms with finding or creating their own identity, they see Sheila going through the same process, and they relate. I think that's uh, very well put, and that's the timeless nature of him. And perhaps uh, also that Sheila's work is as much about ourselves as it is about him. Which brings me to the other question, how much does biography of an artist really matter? Um, you both did a fantastic job, I think, in highlighting some aspects of Sheila's life that is not so well known from his childhood, the trauma that the family went through. Um, but how much is that really necessary to to know about, to approach the work? Um, uh, frankly, I was a little bit hesitating to, to put this syphilis story to the, to the panel today because I'm not uh, very into this bio biographical explanation of artists' works. But in this uh, case, when I, I was invited to, to, to talk about sexuality and gender, I thought, okay, maybe um, that's really a, a, a topic which is, which is not that much known and which I think it's somehow it felt right for me to 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 present it to you also because I think it's uh, what I try to explain is is that it's somehow it 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 goes beyond the what was the zeitgeist at the time this preoccupation was something deeper felt and deeper lived through maybe at least what I what I think and and to come back to your question Stephanie um, how much biography should um, should play a role in, in, in talking about art. Uh, it's, um, maybe I could go, go, go to, to Jane and you have an answer. Pass it on, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Putting the pressure yeah. on, yes. <laughs> you know, one of the things that is um, perhaps not unique to expressionist artists, but I think People, you know, if, if, if you think of all of the Van Gogh movies, people really like to see an expressionist in terms of biography, perhaps more than a quote unquote normal artist. Uh, and this is because of the sense of, of emotional intensity that you see in the works by Sheila or by Vincent van Gogh or by Edvard Munch or, you know, I mean, there, there are a lot of artists that you could put into that group. And so people see this emotion and they say, well, why, why, did, why did he do this? What made him do this? How could somebody, how could anybody paint themselves like this? You know, particularly with Sheila, one hears that a lot. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and you, another thing, you know, he must have been crazy. I get that a lot, too. Um, and he killed himself, didn't he, right? Right? No, he didn't. He died of the flu. It's so boring. <laughs> uh, but this is, this is a desire that the public projects particularly onto these artists. And I think 
we, Verena, other art historians, myself, we have to, we know that this is dangerous. You know, we, we it's necessary, and yet I think we have to always be very careful. Wouldn't you agree? I would agree. And maybe one, again, one, one should differentiate between, um, so, it's, maybe it's not the same answer with every artist or with, with every artwork we are looking at. I was just thinking about Arnold Schoenberg, a different artist which is known as, as a composer but not so much as a, as, an art, as a painter. He, for example, his paintings in my eyes, you can't uh, understand his paintings when you don't know that they, are, they were always related to personal crisis uh, he went through. So when there was a crisis, he then took sort of uh, the medium of painting to 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 go go through that and in in this case for example knowing the biography helps you to to get a deeper information on the work mm -hmm. let's put it like this not maybe not the ne necessary information but something which helps you to understand it in a, in a deeper way i think it's always helpful i mean i, w I wouldn't say you know i mean i'm i'm not advocating ignoring it and in fact we also obsess about these things, you know. The, the you know the I mean, Verena spent years studying Sheila's letters, which you quoted from, you know, and it's it's a lot of fun to see what he writes, you know. This 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 kid telling his mother that you know I'm I'm the most precious fruit that, you know, you must be so happy that I'm your kid, right? I mean, it's, it's, that's hard to resist, isn't it? <laughs> uh, it's hard not to laugh. <laughs> I don't know. I'm also reminded of emails. You know, if you don't hear the tone, how it's written, it's kind of hard to interpret. I wonder if there wasn't a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek tone with that letter. It seems otherwise hard to imagine. Well, that e I mean, ego there, yes, but to that extent, it seems... Uh, it, it's, it, yeah, I mean, this letter is longer, and what's interesting yeah. about this letter is that it, it goes on... Um, and he, which is interesting apropos of tonight's subject, he goes, apparently, um, his sister, his older sister, Melanie, uh, whom he never liked particularly, he was close to the younger one, Gerty, and they always hated her because she was, you know, like she was the grown up, she was uh, the disciplinarian, I guess, uh, who sided with the parents. Uh, so Melanie had gotten into a, uh, a lesbian relationship and was apparently living with a woman or or had a female partner and he is comparing himself you know to the rotten fruit uh, which is his sister and all of this is very you know in view of what we've just been discussing tonight and seeing it's you know to my mind it shows how in the end uh, and during this period when he wrote that letter and also when he was in the process of coming to the decision to marry, he was reverting to his original bourgeois heritage. And that is something that you see also in the work, in the way his style becomes somewhat more conventional and tamer. So you can't, as I said you, before, you yes, you have to be careful with the bi biography, but it is part of the story. Since I have you both on the spot, I have a Sheila question just after looking at your slides. Uh, the hands, what I'm struck by, of course we all know that the hands are always very uh, prominent, but that there's no gender or age really traceable in the hands. The babies have, as adult, male, female, hands as everybody else. It seems to be kind of the one common denominator that is completely separate from, from anything. In fact, that makes me think of a, a, a funny anecdote. Yeah. Um, we had a client um, many years ago who was a doctor who specialized in rheumatoid arthritis and he bought from us a Sheila watercolor of a baby so that he could put it on the cover of his book because he felt that this baby already had rheumatoid arthritis, which I, I'm sure the child did not. <laughs> it 
It just seems the feature that he spent so much focus on and to have that completely independent from all markers is kind of fascinating. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating that you mention it. Uh, it's really um, something... Um, you, 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 I, I was just thinking about the, 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 the baby with the genius, no? the mother with the genius child, and, and it's something um, reaching out, uh, no, no matter who's sort of the, the owner of the hands. And um, this might, yeah, I could add it to my argument um, of a bodily, so quasi common ground where we all come together, no matter which gender, which age we have. I know everybody's been very patient and we offered to have some Q&A with the audience. So at this point, I would like to invite anybody who has something to ask to, to raise their hand and we'll bring the mic over. Uh, would you say that this art reflects a sort of uh, self-hate or internalized homophobia that he had as a reflection of the time in which it was created. For example, his male figures are all sad and expressionless and they all seem so they all seem so anorexic and emaciated and sometimes grotesque. And and as a result of that, do you think that reflects some sort of internalized homophobia that he had as a reflection of what it was like to be a gay man in the time in which this art was created. Well, the women are like that too. So um, I'm not sure, you know, we, I focused on the men because this is a little discussed aspect and it's a very brief period in Sheila's life. Um, I think that I mean, it's it's hard to know. There, you know, we don't really know what his relationship was with these men. We know that it was brief and intense, um, and that this boy, Billy Little, was obviously in love with him. Uh, and we know that he, Sheila, ultimately turned away from this and turned away from it so vehemently that he ended up condemning his own sister for being in a lesbian relationship. So I saw today, the women have faces and they're not quite as thin and emaciated. You know, they're, they're not quite as, as grotesque. You know, they more, look more like regular people. But Sheila's self-portraits are grotesque too. Uh, you know, it's, I mean, the obscuring of the faces, I see, I, see, I, I mean, I could be wrong. You know, that's what's, you know, so interesting about this, that we don't know and it's always interpretive. I saw the, the absence of faces actually as something that he was doing to protect the men. Uh, but I could be wrong. You know, and with the faces of the women, the men were his friends, the women were sex workers, so it didn't matter. I don't know. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Mm. I, would, I would say the same as you said, so I don't see the differentiation between um, male bodies and how he, how he treated them. Maybe this selection of the red nudes is very specific because of it's a it's a it's like a, um, a special treatment of the body. But if you look at other male uh, figures at the, of this same period and compare them as we did with the with female nudes, there there's no I wouldn't say there's there's something different. And at least one of the pregnant women woman, for example, has also no face. So it's I wouldn't dare to 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 say that. And and maybe. What I could add is, um, uh, I go with Jane, I think Erwin Osen was a very uh, imp great importance, was very important uh, person um, for Sheila at the time. That was also maybe why Rösler uh, was sort of jealous having uh, this person so close to, to Sheila at the time. And I don't know if, so to be honest, I, I wouldn't say that Osen was homosexual or bisexual. He was, uh, person 
who entered uh, the stage. He was a theater man. Uh, he was performing. He was transforming. He was um, sort of uh, outlining different identities on stage. And I think that was extremely important for Schiele to discover as a possibility for his finding, a process of finding identities in plural. So this um, not being, but constantly becoming someone else, he, he, I think he was, uh, that was something which was very formative in, uh, at the time in his, um, the time where he was very close to Osen. Um, it seems to me in looking at a lot of the images that you presented that one of the things that I keep being struck about is is dance, right? And modern dance and positions in modern dance. And I'm just wondering what we know about this as an influ potential influence on Sheila and particularly whether dance was an arena where gender ambiguity was also practiced if there were people working at the time, for example, with notions of modern dance and, um, you know, or even sort of underground or whatever, but I can't not look at these images and see um, a lot of reference to an awareness, at least, of, of dance, modern dance, and dance as a, an expression of, you know, uh, psychology or what have you. So I just wondered what we know about Sheila's interest in that at this time. Um, basically, Yes, you're on the right track with all of that. Sheila was definitely interested in modern dance. Um, also in film, which in the silent era was much more like mime. And we know he attended uh, dance performances uh, in Vienna. Uh, but have you done any work on that? I mean, people have written about that to some extent, but not anything that I can specifically cite or put my finger on. I mean, yeah. I, I, know, that I know that he once mentions Ruth Saint-Denis. Uh, so there's one dancer, uh, one dancer she, uh, he, he mentions in his letters. And uh, also Willy Liedl does in a, in a book I, I read. Um, so. There are those famous names which can be so identified, but uh, you showed Moa Mandu um, on the photograph together with Osen. She was, for example, uh, a dancer which was uh, portrayed and also given with the name next to the person portrait, so we can identify her in 1911 by Schiele. And she was, I tried to, to, to trace uh, her because I was so interested in this person, because we don't have that many models which we can identify and give names to them and she's one of them and uh, I did a little bit of research uh, three years ago on, on that um, on, on her and the only thing I could uh, find out that she was uh, of Bosnian um, descent that she was never registered with her name Moa Mandu in Vienna so maybe it was an artist name or she was, was a sort of um, lived with someone and was not never officially thing. and then she moved to Switzerland and then finally got a career uh, in, in Paris. So she, there is um, a person who was very close to Sheila at a very specific time. But I would also um, uh, put uh, Olsen in this um, pool of uh, theater performer, uh, performance uh, persons who were very close to Sheila at the time. There's a lot to, that has been brought up, a lot of subjects here. I uh, met Jane's uh, grandfather when I was a young man. And, uh, in, and uh, he was very nice to me in the gallery. We talked quite a long time. And uh, the, thus became my interest. And plus, there was a Guggenheim show of Sheila and Klimp. Um, so there's many, I, I have enormous amount of books on him and read many of Jane's and others. 
So on the question of dance, since this is the last, perhaps because he knew Ferdinand Odler, the, uh, the, uh, his work, who was very influenced by dance. Also, there was an interest in, you know, the hands play a role and so on and so forth. Is Perhaps it's also because uh, there was a medical interest in uh, certain uh, diseases. I think uh, I remember that Jane had um, <clears throat> Um, Eric Kendall uh, to speak at her uh, gallery, and uh, he may have spoken of things like that. He was very much aware, of, very, uh, and his book t touches upon what was going on at the time. Also, there's an interesting thing of trying to determine the gender or sexuality ideas. Uh, as a painter and someone who draws and who is from an early age, in my early 20s, influenced and still mesmerized by Shelley, I, uh, I think I, there's a lot missed by people because biography does play a great role, as you were saying. In, in, then the psychological things that uh, Sheila was, uh, um, I'm, a, I'm very nervous talking. I don't usually like to talk. <laughs> but this subject interests me so greatly. And you touched on other things. The one thing about uh, Jonathan talking about the German art. And then you have, we didn't just talk about other artists of that time because, there, of course, there was Beckman, and then there was Monk, and, puber, and Monk's puberty, which I think is probably a greater painting than, uh, than perhaps his, um, the one that we know, the um, Scream. <clears throat> one thing with Monk is he kept the body in a more um, in a more naturalistic, it wasn't total. It wasn't he wasn't classical like the uh, whatever his name was, Sasha or that guy's name that he was mentioning. Um, but it was very, uh, and I don't think the distortions that Sheila made were necessarily. Uh, well, it's hard to describe because uh, his work matured and became, or became more conventional, if you will, later, uh, by 1917, 1918. What, uh, you know, and the same thing happened perhaps in Lucian Freud's work. So uh, what I'm wondering to say is, uh, I think the complexity is, oh, it's hard to say. You have to know about drawing, and you have to know. Thank you, Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Is yeah. there one uh, question at the end of these interesting observations? I think everybody's getting restless. It's been such a long evening. Yeah, well, I'm sorry to tell so, you. So um, we're going to have a chance to go and have a glass of wine and maybe continue the conversation one-on-one -on -one also. Yeah. But I thought um, towards the end, because you had such wonderful quotes by Sheila, maybe we end the evening with a quote by Sheila from a letter he wrote to his uncle in 1911. And it's a time when he just left uh, the city of Vienna for a bit. And he's basically explaining to his family why he has to isolate himself and um, turn away from the family and friends also. Um, and I thought it was a wonderful quote because it's very empathetic. Um, and he wrote, quote, I am obsessed with experiencing everything. For this, I must be alone. I mustn't become soft. My organism is harsh. Only my thoughts lead me. I paint the light that emanates from all bodies, male and female. End of quote. Okay, thank you very much.